Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stuart Halloway, and we are here to talk about uh, experience using closure in the field. I first gave a talk with this title two, two and a half years ago. Uh, that talk is already uh, available on InfoQ. This talk will have very little in common with that talk because we have two and a half years more experience to report on, which in internet years is like 71 years. So it's actually quite a lot of information. Uh, we're going to take a slightly different uh, approach than in most of the talks in the conference uh, in the sense that there will be a bigger Q&A period at the end because this is a, an experience sharing talk. Also, I will be um, six statistical percentage points friendlier to interruptive questions during the talk. So we don't have to hold all questions to the end because this really is um, uh, a talk about uh, war stories, if you will. So I want to start by talking about the mission of closure as I see it. And of course, this is as I see it. Other people are, are you know, free to interpret it differently. But I think I have uh, pretty good visibility into a lot of the thought that goes behind closure. And in the way I see it, closure is a language that is designed to help people build information systems. And information systems have a bunch of things that they need. I can get it to stay still. Uh, information systems need to remember things. And the word memory that I use here is not like computer memory. Right? This is like memory memory, where when you make a new memory, you don't forget your old memories. Right? That's how we want information systems to work. We want to be able to remember things and think about them. Um, we also want information systems to be sources of record. So I may remember something, and you may remember it, and 10 other people may remember it. Um, those 10 memories don't add up to a record. Right? A record requires an authority to take note. And we're going to have different spheres of authority in information systems. Uh, in a lot of small information systems, the center of authority is a single database. But you can imagine interesting and more complex systems that draw some data of record information from other services and so forth. When I build information systems, I also want them to have integrity, which means that there are going to be some rules about how data is managed in information uh, systems, and impossible things shouldn't be modelable there. Right? So if we're counting cows, I should be able to have two cows, but I probably should not be able to have two and a half cows, and I almost certainly should not be able to have negative one cows, right? or pi cows, or e cows. So there are going to be domain rules that we want to have enforced as we build these systems. Uh, I also want to have leverage. And when I talk about leverage, what I mean here is power over the data to do useful things. And I'll give two examples to give you an idea of what the opposite of leverage might feel like. Um, one would be that we put data in for, in, into information systems and then we read it back as poetry uh, at parties. Has anybody ever done that? Take your favorite relational database and read the rows out as poetry at a party. Right? That's not why we build information systems. Right? We build information systems to do useful things with the data. Uh, a more practical example, and something that is painfully closer to home, imagine that we have you know, a terabyte of data somewhere, but it's not organized in any useful way. So the answer to any question is, walk through a terabyte of data and see if the answer to the question can be gleaned from that data. So when you think about leverage, when you start to get into the technology bits behind that, you think of words like index. Uh, and words like query language or SQL, those sorts of things, uh, to give you power over the data. And this is a big one, and it's probably the, the least understood in some cases, although people are quite passionate about it. I want my information system to be flexible. In particular, when I have new ideas about what the information system should be able to do, I want it to be able to do them in fairly short order. How many people live in a world where you think a little bit about modifications to your system and those modifications are then present. That's the world I want to live in, right? The only world I've seen that's like that is the um, uh, Star Trek series, which reached its pinnacle in the next generation, and I won't take any argument otherwise. Uh, uh, but in that series, whenever people needed anything from a computer, they needed new capabilities, what would they say? Computer, plot me a course to X. Or computer, tell me what the answer is to this question. Right? I want to move in that direction. I understand that we can't get there all at once or overnight, but I feel like we're pathologically far from there right now. How many of you have ever had the experience that a question from a domain expert that you would agree was a fairly simple extension of what the system already did was practically impossible to do because of the way the system was built? Has anyone ever had that experience? 
Right? Someone comes up and says, well, here's a good example of one of the places where that happens. Well, this used to be batch oriented and we'd like it to be real time now. Right? I just want to get back an answer about what's going on. That's a, that's a great example where systems often you know, get nasty. Now, this is a big challenge, right? Building a system that has these properties in some pleasing proportion. Uh, but it actually gets worse because our users have absurd expectations about the reach of systems. In particular, they expect them to be available. How often do they expect them to be available? Now, all the time, right? Continually. How many people are happy with two nines? Not so much, right? So they want them to be available. Where do they expect them to be available? Everywhere, right? I'm in low Earth orbit on vacation, and I don't understand why I can't, uh, you know, look at my iPhone or whatever. They also have these ridiculous and expanding, or maybe better put, contracting uh, expectations about form factor, right? It used to be the case that to get information out of an information system, you might have to go where it was or call somebody who was where it was. And then we evolved to, you could have a computer-like device in your own home, a crazy idea that, um, where you could get information. But now what do people expect? They expect that I should be able to walk away from the screen and have this little blue lantern ring actually control the screen, which I'm barely able to have it do. There we go. If I stand right here, all is well. So people also have expectations about immediacy. Uh, when they have this system, this tiny, you know, decoder ring that has all their internet information that they want to get to on it and they're on their uh, vacation in low Earth orbit and they want to get information. How quickly do they want that information to get there? Immediately. Immediately. And how recent do they want that information to be? Stock prices from yesterday? No. Stock prices from this morning? Uh-uh. Yeah. Stock prices, what they actually want is stock prices that got to them faster than the speed of light from wherever they happened. <laughs> and we're going to have to work with them on that requirement because that's not going to go well. Now, we have the laws of physics that come into play as we think about how to build a system that has these characteristics, a system that has memory and good records with integrity and leverage, and a system that's available all the time, and it has tiny form factor endpoint devices for users. And the laws of physics that we have to work with are that memory is insanely expensive. It's impossible to afford more than a few dozen kilobytes of it. Likewise, storage is expensive, right? It's impossible to afford maybe a megabyte of it. And machines are precious. There's a relatively small number, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of machines on the planet, and they're all dedicated named things. They're not anonymous, low, low capacity, low reliability, replaceable things. Um, and as such, because all these things are expensive, they tend to be dedicated. Right? My system is running on a server named Fred, and when Fred is broken, I can go pop the back of Fred open and pull out a hard drive and stick a new hard drive in and then we can get Fred back up and running. These are the laws of physics for which our programming languages were designed. Are these the laws of physics in software today? Are they, far for, are they close or just way off? It's like the opposite in every direction, right? Memory is cheap and tending towards free, although we don't need it to get to free to make the, the point of this argument. Right? If memory was only a million times more capacious than it was in the 70s, oh wait, it is. Right? Storage is cheap, tending towards free. If only it was a million times more capacious than it was in the 70s, oh, it is. Um, boxes are less and less dedicated special things. What are they? They are ephemeral, crappy, unreliable, but infinitely um, scalable in terms of you can stand up as many as you want coming from places like Amazon Web Services. So the presumptions under which we built systems have all changed. Do the mainstream programming languages uh, do anything to recognize these changes? And by mainstream programming languages, I'll go C, C++, Java, C Sharp, the top of the heap. Nothing. Right? All of these languages uh, are really locked in to a set of presumptions that obtained 30 years ago. So what are we going to do? What we need is a comprehensive plan of doing things differently. That comprehensive plan, there's a lot of different entry points that you might start with. One part of that comprehensive plan is a representation for data. Right? 
We are living in a world where there are thousands of times more machines and thousands of times more connectivity than ever before, which means we have to move data around. And our data representations um, peak in capability at, I don't know, XML, JSON. We need to reconsider whether those representations uh, are the best fit for this world. We need a way to have values. So both memories and records are based on the notion of value. I can remember what I ate for breakfast this morning. Tomorrow, when I eat something else for breakfast, I will not necessarily forget what I ate for breakfast today. But we model our computer systems in exactly that way. right? If you have a field in your object, what I ate for breakfast, and you now eat something for breakfast today, what happens to what you ate for breakfast yesterday? Boop, gone. Right? So we need a system of values. We need a model for operation where operations are operations on values. Right? So we need a model for saying there was a value and then we get to a new value. Those of you who were at my talk yesterday heard this uh, uh, ad nauseum, I suppose. Uh, but we need a way for, for modeling operations on values. And we need a way for modeling coordination of operation. Right? We have more distributed systems than ever before, so there's more stuff happening all at once. And a lot of that stuff needs a little coordination. I want to say that again very slowly. There's a lot of stuff happening all at once. A lot of that stuff needs a little coordination. A lot more of it needs no coordination whatsoever. Right? The world actually has multiple things happening in parallel. How many threads of execution are active in this room right now? If threads of ex execution are human brains? Lots. Quite a few. And they're relatively independent one from another. Right? If I'm thinking really hard about something, it doesn't change your ability to think really hard about that same thing, or your best conception of that same thing, nor does it stop you from thinking about something entirely different. So systems that were designed when things were small and precious have this almost, it's not that they have this sort of bias for coordination. They don't even think about the fact that coordination isn't how the world works. Right? Coordination is a very small local phenomenon, and that's not the kinds of systems that we're building anymore. We cannot build this comprehensive plan. Now, by the way, everything I said up until now is absolutely stone tablets coming down from the mountain true. What I'm about to say is conjecture and might possibly be slightly inaccurate. So I just want to keep clear the distinction between those things so you don't get lost. So I don't think that we can get to these places with a sort of uh, nuke the current way from orbit and build something entirely new. I think that the road to the future has to interoperate with the present. I could be wrong about this. It could be that next week some company will announce, or some open source initiative or whatever, will announce some vision for how to get there that has no interop with what's there now, and it will be so amazing and compelling that we'll all figure out how to get to it. But I kind of doubt it. So I need a way to get to all these things, but I need to get there in a way that's interoperable with technology that works today. That probably also means, if you want to break this down, that my plan for getting there is not going to be a giant comprehensive pull one switch and I'm in the future. It's going to be a series of small tactical changes, hopefully with a, st a strategy behind them that adds up to a big deal, which means that not only do I need to interop with systems that are available today, but I need to be able to adopt these new ideas or improved ideas in a piecemeal fashion, at least at first. So I'd like to be able to say, well, if I had a better way to represent data, I could adopt that immediately without having to buy the rest of this. Or if I had a better way to think about values, I could adopt that immediately without having, a, have, having to buy all the rest of this. Finally, we need to value simplicity more than we do today. And by simplicity, I mean uh, taking apart complex things and delivering them a la carte. The biggest problem with every software system I know what the biggest problem is with your software system. You can exclude yourself from this analysis if you've been working on your project for less than two weeks. Right? <laughs> if you've been working on a project for more than two weeks, I know the biggest problem with your system. It's the complexity of the code you already wrote. And it's saying, I want to do x, but x got harder when I made a choice 10 days ago, and y got easier, but now I want to do x and I can't go back. And the one tool that we have at our disposal to fight that trend, and it's never going to be an easy fight, is to make things simple so that the road to x and y both stay open as we make changes in our systems. Finally, finally, 
if I may. I also would like to have, while I want this to interoperate with the way the world works today, I want there to be eventually a vision that ties it all together. A vertically integrated stack that thinks this way, that has these ideas. And I understand that only greenfield projects will be able to adopt that vertically integrated stack and that most people will have to work in sort of a crab-wise fashion uh, into a new world. But it would be nice to have that vertically integrated stack. So, what are we here to talk about today? Not really just closure, but a closure-inspired vertically integrated stack that delivers all of those benefits and can allow you to adopt parts of the stack piecemeal. I think the stack starts at the bottom with two data interchange formats, Eden and Freshen. Eden is a subset of the data structure language used in Clojure itself that has been carved out and uh, exists. It competes in the same space as JSON. So when you see Eden, think, oh, this is something that I might use where I would currently use JSON or XML uh, in a program. Freshen is Eden's bat out of hell binary sibling. So it is a dynamically uh, typed extensible data representation uh, that has a lot in common conceptually and API-wise with Eden, but is binary and optimizes for efficiency instead of for human readability. On top of that, we have the closure language. Uh, on top of that, potentially, we have Datomic, which is a database designed by the designer of closure and along the same principles. And for uh, JavaScript development, we have ClojureScript which is a dialect of closure that compiles to efficient JavaScript by targeting Google's whole program optimization of JavaScript. So this is a very special beast. It makes programs that are specifically designed to emit JavaScript source code that's then targetable by a whole program optimizer. This is the same whole program optimization that Google uses on a lot of their things. And so we're aiming to compete for performance sort of in that space. Now, the weakest part of the story right now, I'll tell you candidly, if you go back to my list of things I want, is integration. You can imagine that that comes last. That when you tell the story of all these pieces come together, all the pieces come together, and then after a while and after experimentation, there's integration. But this is starting to come together in such a way that there are people building apps using this as a full stack. And I'm pleased to announce that at Closure West, uh, about a month from now in Portland, Oregon, uh, my company, Relevance, will be open sourcing an opinionated, rich application development framework that ties all these things together. I would love to tell you what the name of that framework is, and as soon as marketing tells me what the name of that framework is, I will tell you. Um, internally, it has been called Project Pedestal up until now, and I'm super excited about it because it aspires to be um, uh, the piece that adds integration and developer approachability uh, to a level that has not prior ex uh, previously existed in the closure space. So that's where we are. That's what we're trying to do. It's not just about a language. It's about taking away a thinking that first was publicly released in the closure language and uh, taking that across the entire stack. With that in mind, let's talk about the community's experience of closure. So uh, Chaz Emmerich who is a longtime Clojure programmer and is the author of some Clojure programming book uh, that O'Reilly published, which is reputed to be extraordinarily good and better than my book, for example. I'm not jealous or anything. Um, he also does a survey of the community called the State of Clojure Survey, which I have now acronymized as SOX. And uh, for 2012 was the third iteration of the State of Clojure Survey. Uh, there's now 6,700 people on the closure mailing list to give an idea of the size of community by, proxied by people that are on the main mailing list for the community. Uh, and 1,372 of those people responded to his questionnaire. I haven't reproduced all the charts here, but this one is just how long have you been doing closure? And what you see from this chart is there's a substantial number of people who've been doing it for a long time. Right? So you've got almost 20% in the three years and more category. There's a substantial bolus of people that have been using it for a while, one to two years, another about 30%. And then you've got a substantial group of people, 40%, that have just started using it or only using it for a few months. So I'm going to read this as positive in all directions. There have been a lot of people using it, and there's a rapid rate of growth in people coming in at the beginning. Or maybe people who've just started have more time to fill out surveys. 
hard to know for sure. And so what I'd like to talk about is some of the reactions of the community to closure and opportunities and problems that they've seen. I'm going to have to move my de decoder ring closer. So people perceive a ton of opportunity in closure. Probably the biggest single thing that people point out that drives people to closure is they hear it's a badass language for concurrency. So if people think they have a concurrent systems problem, they're like, oh, well, Clojure is supposed to be specially good at that, so I'll go and take a look. In particular, they often gravitate to one feature within concurrency, which is called software transactional memory, or STM. So that accounts for a lot of people coming to Clojure. I didn't come to Clojure for any of that stuff. I would put myself in the yellow pie wedge, which is Lisp. I read a book by this, um, some hack named Paul Graham, who's always out there going on about how Lisp makes everything taste better. And I bought some of those arguments, and so I was like, I've got to find myself a Lisp, but getting back to my point about interop, I didn't want a private island Lisp. Right? I didn't want a Lisp ecosystem that wasn't part of a, a dominant developer ecosystem, so I went to Google and typed in Lisp that runs on Java, and up came closure, and the rest is um, unfolding history. Uh, there are a lot of people who are interested in metaprogramming, so this red pie wedge represents people who want to do domain-specific language stuff. I think this is a big draw, particularly for people who are coming from languages like Ruby and Python, where they're used to having a lot of power in that area, but they want to have a language that's closer to the metal without sacrificing that sort of expressive power. Uh, and then you also see people coming from functional programming. So people who believe in the uh, sort of simplicity and correctness benefits that come from taking a functional approach. And more broadly speaking, people just wanting a more expressive language. So that's sort of a rough view of what people come in thinking they want. But it's not what they actually find. The pie chart of what they actually find is quite a bit different. By far, the dominant benefit of closure is simplicity. And in particular, I mean that the simplicity as Rich Hickey defines it and as the dictionary defines it, um, which is the absence of complexity, the absence of things being braided together. When things are braided together, you can't take them apart, and you are stuck with something that does what you want, braided with something that does something that is against what you want, and it's very hard to build systems like that. It would seem that this is obvious, but people quite often put the other less um, historically valid definition of simplicity ahead of that definition, and that's the definition where simplicity is synonymous for easy. Right? And so there's a quest to make things easy. Well, you can make things easy in the short run by making a function that does exactly what somebody wants to do and handing it to them. Right? That always is going to make it really easy. If you say, I need to do x, and I write a function called x that does what you need and hand it to you, that's really easy. But the details of how I did that may make it in totally impossible to reuse that code for any other purpose in the future. So ease is not necessarily a friend of simplicity. The other thing that people really get out of closure is power. And when I talk about power here, Arguably the best way to summarize this is to use Rich's own quote about designing Clojure, where he said, I did not design Clojure to replace Ruby or Python in my day job. I designed Clojure to replace Java in my day job. Now, this doesn't represent a hatred of Java. It doesn't represent any particular feelings about those languages, other than that Clojure is designed to be expressive but also down to the metal. So when you need performance or interop with the existing platform, in our case the JVM, that you'd be able to get it. And so that's a huge reason that people stay when they come to Clojure. Another related thing to simplicity is Clojure's use of abstraction. How many people know how many methods are in java.util.map? Does anybody know off the top of your head? Dozens. I think it's like 18. It's an order of a dozen and a half methods in map. When you look at closure, people presume, because it's a dynamically typed language and a Lisp, that there's not going to be a lot of interface-based abstraction, but there is. And so underneath all of closure's code, you don't see this, things just work, there are a ton of tiny abstractions. So where Java has java.util.map, closure has a half dozen abstractions with two or three, or in some cases one or zero methods each that describe different capabilities. And that obviously goes hand in hand with trying to deliver simplicity. Right? If I hand you, hand you a box with 18 features, and you don't need all 18 of those features, and you can describe a subset of them that you do need, I've caused a problem for you. 
Clojure also helps people with its approach to time. So there's a model in Clojure of values plus succession. And so there is no unscripted mutation in Clojure, right? You have values, and those values can succeed. They can process from one value to another, but there is no sort of mucking around inside of values. And this is really the essence of the kind of encapsulation we should be aiming for, right? In OO languages, we tend to try to encapsulate uh, implementation details of mutable things. Uh, in Clojure, the thing that is considered most worthy of encapsulation is mutability itself. Right? That is actually the thing that makes systems non-composable, right? because I'm holding on to this thing and it squirrels out from under me and becomes something else. And so the encapsulation that you see in Clojure is encapsulation of mutation, and that is the thing that has to be carefully protected and not allowed out of an abstraction boundary. And then some of the other things that were already mentioned um, on the presumed advantages of Clojure also show up on this list. A big one that I'd also like to call out is the community. Uh, the Clojure community is an extremely friendly, welcoming place. There's always a ton of people on the mailing list and on IRC who are willing to essentially give you free consulting as long as you can phrase your question in an interesting enough fashion. So there's a, there's a nice sense there. Um, uh, we work very hard in running the mailing list to avoid an environment where there is you know, conversation in a personally hostile tone as has been associated historically with some dialects of Lisp. Most of you are probably not here primarily about the opportunity and win side of closure. You're interested enough to be here in the room because you think there might be some win to it. But what you really want to know is the sordid underbelly. What's bad? What doesn't work? What has been a nightmare for the community? So now I want to talk about the fears that people experience coming into LISP and Clojure and how those fears then plan out. By far, the biggest single fear point if you just did a search of Twitter, right? So if you limited yourself to only people who can only express themselves in 140 characters or less, you would come to the conclusion that the biggest problem in Clojure is its use of parenthesis as a delimiter. The second biggest problem, and this is an interesting one, is too much Java. I thought I was going to get a new language, but there's a lot of Java showing in this language. What's going on here? Uh, the third one is just straight up, I had a bad experience with Lisp. I just had a bad experience. Stop asking me. I had a bad experience. So people don't want to, you know, so they're afraid of Lisp. But funnily, coming in right after that is not Lispy enough. So, uh, you know, uh, every sufficiently advanced Lisp programmer is their own private island of opinions about how Lisp should be. So when Clojure first came out, you can imagine that as with every new Lisp, um, every good Lisper descended on it to destroy it and came out with cogent criticisms of different things they wanted, which I categorize here as the not enough or not my kind of Lisp. People are afraid of IDE support or the lack thereof. Right? I'm going to start using this language and it's not going to have tools. Um, people are afraid that it's not object-oriented programming. So if you look at the, the big languages that have become available on the JVM other than Java, you have you know, Groovy and JRuby and Scala out there. If you look at those languages, they have in common that they are object-oriented to a strong and visually familiar degree to somebody coming from OO to OO. So there's a comfort to that, and Clojure does not provide that. It's not an object-oriented language. And then people are worried about, can I debug my program when things go wrong? That's the fear. Here's the actual problems. So first, I'll talk about the half of the pie that is IDE support, debugging, documentation, and discoverability. And I want to do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that a new language came along and Every design choice in that language was aesthetic and tasteful and beautiful to, agree, to a degree heretofore unseen. Like just this a beautiful, amazing language. Uh, of course, the language is young, and so there's all kinds of fleshing out to do, but there's nothing wrong with it at its core. Right? There's nothing that people look at and go, oh my god, that really sucks. What would they have left to complain about in such a language? They would be able to say, well, everything about that's great, but there's no IDE support. Everything about that's great, but the stack traces suck. Everything about that's great, but I can't attach a debugger. Everything about that is great, 
but the documentation is not as good as for things that have been around for 20 years. Um, everything is great, but I can't find the information that I need. I can't discover the libraries that I want to use. So the whole left-hand side of the pie, 50% of the real problems, I'm going to turn the tables and say are actually an indicator of supreme awesomeness, right? That because the language itself is such a sound, solid step forward for the industry, that the real complaints about it are, can you put more tools in our hand that actually make it practical to adopt it? Now, they are real problems. The documentation needs to be miles better. The ability to debug needs to be miles better. Uh, I disagree with uh, the raw assertion that we want to use the same kind of tools to debug that we used to. Right? I think there should be different approaches. And that actually becomes a documentation problem as well. I don't feel the absence of a debugger because I've learned enough that I don't ever need a debugger. That's true in most other languages that I've ever worked in as well. That being said, that documentation is not out there. There's not an easy roadmap uh, to go from zero to having that kind of knowledge. So all those things are real problems, and they will continue to be real problems. The other nice thing about these problems, though, is that solving them is horizontally scalable across the community. All of these problems are not at the bottom of the language. They're not in the parser. They're not in the software transactional memory implementation. All these problems are solvable by us, the community, by people who are new and old to closure to varying degrees. They're very solvable. But then you have this other big problem that I haven't characterized yet, which takes up half of the pie, and that is alien spacecraft. So closure has this problem that, that we characterize as I got up one morning and I walked outside and somebody had landed an alien spacecraft on my lawn. And the problem is that this alien spacecraft actually can travel land, sea, air, and outer space. It's incredibly comfortable. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. It's like the TARDIS, actually, in a lot of ways. Uh, but I don't know how to use any of the controls for it. So I look at the TARDIS and I'm like, well, I can't drive it to work. I don't see any wheels on that thing. I don't see the anti-theft system. And so I can just make a list of things that I'm used to that it doesn't have and that I wish it had. And this is the real challenge for closure. And what happens, uh, hands up, yes? I think the bigger problem is that if you drove it to your work, your boss would be terrified is the true extension of the metaphor. So yes, there is another observation that is fair is that, that um, uh, everybody else is you know, building their software with their horses and buggies and you show up with the alien spacecraft. Even if the alien spacecraft is helping you get work done, there may be some, um, there may be some political challenges in showing up with your alien spacecraft and your alien weaponry. So why is closure an alien spacecraft? It's partially the fault of us as a community and how we approach it. Um, how many people know that, that old saw about the five guys who are touching the elephant? And they each have like this totally different idea about what the elephant is. Closure has that in spades, right? Because if you come to it looking for a lisp, what do you find? You find a lisp and a bunch of comparisons with closure as a lisp. If you come to it as a functional programmer, you find its uh, you know, approach to values and so on, and you, you sort of analyze it in those terms. If you come to it from you know, Ruby or Python and you're looking for an expressive way to write DL, uh, DSLs, you dive headfirst into the macro capabilities and stub your toes there for a while, as everybody does, and then come out with an analysis of closure that's based on that. And the bottom line is that people want uh, you know, a bucket from past experience into which they can every drop, drop every new experience. That's the way you get a handle on it. It's also a great journalistic technique. If I'm going to write a one-page article about each new JVM language, then what I want to do is be able to give you a hook so you can go, oh yeah, that's an X, right? So you can say with Ruby, oh yeah, well, it's Ruby, but it's for Java. And with Scala, you can say, oh, it's the actor model. Or you can say, oh, it's the static typing option going forward. I mean, there are various things you can put your hands on and say. And of course, with Clojure, the two that people gravitated towards were it's a Lisp or it has software transactional memory. Um, those are both aspects of its alien spacecraftness, but you really can't appreciate it until you have taken the time to really explore in detail and take closure on its own terms, which means having the patience to resist making your metaphoric choice too early. I made my metaphoric choice too early. I came in thinking Lisp, and the writing about closure in my first book reflects that, um, and in the second book even to some degree. Uh, but it really is um, systematically and thoroughly considered. I guess that's the thing that I would say, is that everything about closure that's different from something you've seen before 
was carefully considered by Rich, the designer of Clojure, in contrast to things you have seen before. Right? Rich did his entire career programming C and Java and C Sharp. So every time you see something in Clojure that's weird and looks like an alien artifact, you have to ask yourself, why would somebody who had spent years with C and C Sharp and Java and gotten frustrated with all of them created this thing? And only when you've started to answer that question 30 or 40 times in different areas does it really start to come together. Now, I have something I have to confess about the last four charts. There are exactly six charts in this presentation. One of those charts is accurate, which is this chart, which summarizes the level of accuracy of the other charts. Um, one of the charts is from an anecdotal survey. So the original chart that I said came from the, the uh, state of closure, that is a real chart. It's from an anecdotal survey, so it doesn't have statistical uh, validity, but it's from an anecdotal survey. And then all those pie charts about what people thought going in and what people thought coming out, I just made that stuff up. And I did that for a reason. Well, for a couple of reasons. First, now you have a homework exercise. There really is a state of closure survey. There are dozens of questions that have actually been answered by the community. It's silly for us to all come and meet in a room for me to regurgitate those. You should go read them on the internet. Right? They're out there. So what you got instead is uh, an expert's opinion on how those things actually play out in my view. And so you can take that and contrast that with other experts and with the community and do something with it. But the best I can do is give you my best information. And that's what I'm trying to do. And to that end, I'm going to drop the charade and actually talk specifically not about the community experience, but about my experience. And my experience primarily has been in building Datomic. So in November, what is this, 26 months ago, uh, I started working full time on Datomic, which is a commercial database written in Clojure. And I have uh, done that full time, essentially, uh, since then. Um, I had already been using Clojure full time for a couple of years uh, before that. Uh, but this was really in the heat of battle in product development. And so I'm now in a position to be quite specific about how Clojure helped me and where I had problems. So the first thing is definitely simplicity. Closure's emphasis on values and references is how we're going to think about software five years from now. I made this claim in my previous talk yesterday, and I was told that that was a strident claim. When I'm told that something is strident, I like to just say it louder. So I didn't realize it was strident, or I would have said it louder the first time. Uh, we need to be programming with values. We made a decision in the 1970s that we would model memory and records in the human sense with computer memory and storage. And the metaphor is really twisted, right? My memory is not update in place. Systems of record are definitely not update in place. You don't go down to the courthouse when you get divorced and get to a race that you were married. Although I understand the motivations in that scenario could, could be strong. You don't get to do that. And yet we've modeled our systems in terms of update in place. Now there are, are other things out there that are heading in this direction. So when people talk about append only and things like that, those are definitely you know, little surface moves uh, towards the whole vision. But the whole vision really is a system of values and a system of successive transformation of values and perceiving identity across values. And I would definitely recommend that you uh, watch some of Rich Hickey's talks uh, that are available on the web about that stuff. The second thing, and this is easier to explain, uh, and is actually a wonderful example of simplicity, is if you think about the way interface and implementation work, in most object-oriented languages, you have two things, right? You have an interface, and then you have an implementation. That actually turns out not to be simple. And the reason that it's not simple is that you have an interface, and you have an implementation, and then you have, I want to tie that interface and that implementation together. I want to state this implementation conforms to this interface. But in Java and C Sharp, those statements are done in situ. Right? So I say, you know, create new class, blah. What do I say after that if I want to have an interface? Implements, whatever. Right? That bakes in a presumption that I have to have all the interfaces in hand before I do what? Before I define a class. 
That's a terrible presumption in reality, and it's a great example of, of something that's complex that inflicts a ton of cost, because what happens is I get a piece of code that you wrote, a wonderful bit of implementation, and I look at an interface that we use internally in my company, and your code exactly corresponds to that interface, but guess what? Your code doesn't implement that interface because you didn't have that interface when you wrote your, your code, right? You couldn't have. It's my interface. So what do I do when I get in that situation? Wrap it. I wrap it. There's some design pattern names that we can whip out for this, right? Don't you have a little, like, little roll of cards in your wallet that have like, words like adapter on them? Right? There's a whole series of things that we can whip out to deal with this. But an adapter on a thing is not the thing anymore. And an adapter on the thing not being a thing can actually cause programs to stop working. So there are ways in, certainly there are ways in other languages to do this. So Groovy and Ruby and Scala all have approaches to this. And I don't really have time to explain why, but they're all inferior. <laughs> but probably more importantly, they all acknowledge the problem. Right? We all agree that there's a problem here. Right? And so regardless of whether they are inferior or not, we're all fighting on the side of solving this problem. The way that this ends up uh, coming out in Datomic is a great example of this is Datomic's storage indirection. Most databases have storage baked in. Right? I install Postgres, I expect it's talking to a hard drive somewhere. Datomic does not have storage baked in. It's an abstraction boundary. So I can say I want Datomic to store stuff in files or in a web service based thing like Amazon DynamoDB or in Postgres or in Oracle or in MySQL or in JBoss and Finispan. I can do all those things because of a protocol. Right? There's a protocol that says, how am I going to talk to storage? Now, in a certain sense, this is not rocket science. Everybody's used to using interfaces. Right? But there's just a lot of tedium with using them in mainstream languages that maybe become just enough tedium that you don't actually get over the, the, the bump and actually use them. And the moment that I really had an aha moment about this, there was a day that I was working on some tests, and I wanted to have a stubbed out version of Datomic. So I wanted to have something that acted like Datomic, but wasn't, particularly in the storage capacity piece of it. And Rich looked at me and said, hmm. And the next day, he had come back, and he had extended Datomic's storage protocol to java.util.concurrent.hashmap. And when he did that, which, by the way, was less than 15 lines of code, right, when he did that, Datomic now had an in-memory footprint. Right? The entire database just immediately started working as a plain in-memory database. And we have repeatedly had the ability to say Datomic is going to go in a different direction. And the way in which Datomic goes in a different direction is vastly different from the way other organizations I've seen change. Right? The way it goes in a different direction is we think really hard for hours or days, and then we write 10 lines of code. And Datomic is really different. Question. How many, so the question was, how many lines of code to extend it to MongoDB? So if we did that, what we would have is uh, Datomic on the front for transaction and query and the storage reliability of MongoDB beneath. Yeah. So it should be straightforward. It should be straightforward. It has not been requested. The ones that have been requested are React and Couchbase. And those are present. So you can actually use Datomic targeting React or Couchbase as its storage engines. But we haven't had anybody ask for Mongo. So power. The big thing here is we wrote a database in this incredibly expressive language. One could definitely write a database as powerful as Datomic in low-level languages. It would take a long time, but you could do it, right? You could write it in C or C++ or Java or C Sharp. But the amazing thing about it to me is that we wrote it in this very expressive high-level language where we can do things in a tiny number of lines of code. And the number of times that we dropped to Java for performance reasons, zero. Zero. We did drop to Java for other reasons. So for example, there are some libraries that might be installed somewhere where Clojure is not available. So there are a couple of libraries that are ancillary libraries for Datomic that are written in pure Java specifically to minimize the size of the jar dependency in a constrained environment. So there are other reasons, but performance was never a reason. And finally, I would say that using a, an expressive Lisp really allowed us to have a tiny, dry code base. 
So we really have an absurdly small number of lines of code in play. Now, now, those lines of code are very dense. One of the other things that people do get scared of with any expressive language is, wow, it takes me 10 times longer to read that thing that does 100 times more stuff. I'm like, listen to what you just said. It took you 10 times longer to read something that does 100 times more stuff. You win. <laughs> right? It's definitely like that, right? It definitely takes 10 times longer to read. It's, it's not a quick read, and it doesn't have to be a quick read. Which gets to another thing. You know, I said before that, um, I said at the very beginning that the mission was about building information systems. Let me give you a couple of other possible missions for closure in the ecosystem. One possible mission is teaching novices how to program. Like the dominant mission for closure could be teaching novices how to program. Another possible mission for closure could be for hobbyists to have a ton of fun using closure to make music or to control AR drones, or to drive Lego Mindstorm robots or Arduino boxes or whatever. People are doing all those things. Right? People are doing all those things. People are, people are using Clojure to learn how to program. People are using pro, uh, Clojure for fun. But none of those things, in my mind, are the bullseye center of the mission. Right? Clojure is a language written by production developers for production developers for business systems, right? for systems that um, have hard requirements. So now I'd like to talk about what your experience is likely to be like as someone considering adopting closure. And I'd like to start with an anecdote. This anecdote is from May 2011. Um, this is actually the first time I ever heard of a closure developer named Chris Granger. And what Chris Granger did is he created a little website called I Will Build a Web Prototype for You with a little advertising copy on it. And he basically said, I'll build your idea in two weeks for $5,000, and I will build your site, bottom line here, I will build your site in Clojure. And obviously, I was interested in this. Right? I was working at the company that, um, that has you know, a lot of the core committers to Clojure working with me. And I was like, wow, here's this guy, I've never heard of him, who's saying that he's going to build people's websites in Clojure. And then when you click, if you scroll down through his website, and there's a link to this at the end of the Prezo, uh, if you scroll down through his website, there's a like frequently asked questions section that's like, you know, why are you going to build this enclosure? And he says, because I can build it faster and better that way with anything else than with anything else. And then, you know, why isn't it something else? And he's like, shove off. If you don't want to build it with something else, you should get somebody else. There are plenty of, you know, somebody else's out there in the world that could, you know, do it for you some other way. And the point I want to make here was that as of a couple of years ago, there were people out there who felt that closure was sufficiently mature, that having made an investment in it, they could be faster and stronger, even in tiny projects, than they would be in any other way. Now, the real question is, you know, obviously some people can feel that way. Chris Granger clearly felt that way. Um, if those of you who have followed his career since then, he is now um, working on a funded startup to produce an IDE called Light Table which um, initially targets closure in JavaScript, I believe, but is a very sort of outer space alien weapon uh, IDE as it is conceived. The real question is, what's the curve to get to where Chris is? What does one have to do to get to the level where you could say, I could do this thing, and it's going to be better for me than other things than I would have? And I want to talk about, in order to think about that, how you go about evaluating a tool. One important aspect of evaluating any kind of tool you're going to use is discovering its uses, figuring out how it works, figuring out what the controls are. I'm acutely aware of this because my eyesight has decayed in the last couple of years. I'm at that point where you're holding you know, books back from your face kind of phase. So I'm acutely aware of the discoverability of user interfaces that, for example, make a poor use of color. Um, for example, some conferences that I've been to have these black pamphlets with eight different shades, including a couple of different greens, identifying the rooms that you would go to. I'm not going to name any names. Um, but there's a discoverability aspect. There's also frequency of use. So if I'm going to use a tool excruciatingly rarely, I better be able to discover it once and commit that to memory forever, which, by the way, my memory is not so great. So while it is not update in place, it's not constantly being trumped by new things. It is forgetful in various ways. Uh, frequency of use is going to affect how I feel about discoverability, right? 
Um, because in a lot of cases, many, many times a day, you are rediscovering some aspect of how your tool works. And if you don't believe that's true, turn off tool tips, turn off documentation, turn off your internet connection, and try to write software for a few hours. And I want to have power. I want my tool to be, have power. Well, how much power do I want my tool to have? Is it possible for a tool to have too much power? I see some nodding heads that no. And I think it is absolutely possible for a tool to have too much power. Let's say that Twitter added a new feature where you could type in GPS coordinates and it would launch missiles at them. That's too much power, right? Twitter shouldn't have that capability. I, I should not be able to say, you know, darn you, Justin Getland, and then list his GPS coordinates and have, you know, ordnance hit his house. So it's definitely possible for something to be too powerful. So the question is, when you're evaluating a tool, and obviously your primary development language is a really important tool, right? Your primary development language is going to really influence your day-to-day -day life. So when you're evaluating a tool, you're going to consider these aspects and maybe many others. And there's a lot of things that go into this. I certainly want plenty of power in my programming language. Right? In, for, for starters, I want it to be Turing complete. Um, I've seen some other developers who I think should not be allowed to use Turing complete languages. Uh, but, but I want to use one myself, generally. Um, and there's also this trade-off between, am I going to use the tool six hours a day? Or am I going to use the tool every other day? Or am I going to use the tool you know, once in six months? I end up opening OmniGraffle almost every day. So I kind of need to have the muscle memory of where things are in OmniGraffle, or I'm not going to be you know, very effective. Um, I'm an inept user of social media. So I probably only open LinkedIn once every two weeks. So when I open that, I'm like, oh yeah, how does this work? Where are things? You know, whatever. And so I actually care more about the discoverability, in some sense, of LinkedIn than I do about OmniGraffle. Why? Because by the time I get back to it, I've, already, I've always forgotten how it works. It sort of doesn't matter, which is why I'm an Emacs user. Right? I use Emacs you know, eight hours a day, which means the fact that it's fiendishly non-discoverable doesn't matter to me anymore. But it's not a benefit that it's fiendishly non-discoverable. Right? That, that is mitigated by the fact that having put in enough of an investment, uh, I can use it. And so the question then you want to ask about something like Clojure is where is it on that curve? It's an ominous sign that most Clojure developers use Emacs. Right? Because that suggests that they are already, well, it might be ominous and good, right? It suggests that they're willing to uh, put up with a fiendishly difficult learning cool, uh, curve in order to have a very powerful tool. Yeah, it's because of the would be. Well, there are certainly affinities, but even that is also like a beneficial and potentially ominous sign. The way I would evaluate these three questions, though, is to go back and look at the mission. Our mission is to build information systems that can have good memories and solid records and give you integrity in manipulating those and have leverage over them and have flexibility. And so the question is, what things do you end up prioritizing if you're going to do this? If you are building a web application that you already know how to build in the tool of your choice and you already know you can build it in less than two weeks, what are the odds that some other tool is going to make you better at it within two weeks? Almost none. If you are faced with a hard problem, that you don't know how to solve with the tools that you have, or it's not obvious that you can solve with the tools that you have, then you're in a completely different place. Now again, the problem is that it's a continuum. I would argue that when Chris Granger said, I can knock out a website for you in a couple of weeks, he was arguing that Clojure had moved a long way from the, obviously you would use this to, for hard problems, into the, and it's now suitable for using for medium sized and small problems as well. And I think that it's a complex and subtle argument, and nobody likes complex and subtle arguments, so I'm going to dumb it down into just two numbers. Right? And those two numbers are what I'm going to call effective and alien powers. And I would argue that if you made a commitment to using Clojure and you were a decent software developer already, you'd be effective in three months. And by effective, I mean you could keep up competitively doing whatever your job is compared to whatever tool set you use now. Obviously, there's going to be bands of variation around this, but I'm just picking a number. This has all the same statistical vi uh, val validity of the earlier charts, by the way. Uh, and then I would say that it is a long road to alien powers. I'm going to characterize it as 18 months head first. To, now, obviously, you acquire different sub-alien power levels of power along the way. So it's not like you have to wait for 15 months while nothing happens, because right? that would be disappointing. 
right? But you have, the, you have this sort of trend. And I would also say that in my own professional career, I began my professional career as a C language developer. And the reason that I chose C language development was that it was the highest paid work study job at my college. So it really didn't represent any particular um, uh, advocacy on a, on a language level. I transitioned from C to C++ because I was told to, um, essentially. I transitioned from C++ to Java in an attempt to expand my marketability and learn new things. Uh, I transitioned from Java to, Java to Ruby uh, because I fell under the spell of Dave Thomas and others. And I transitioned from Ruby to Clojure after, at, really for the first time in my life, having gone out on a, on a targeted search. So all those other transitions in my own career represented, you know, I kind of stumbled through it, right? I kind of got from point A. But my transition from Ruby to Clojure represented having a set of things I wanted and then going out and looking for something that might deliver those things. I would say that of all those transitions, the longest learning curve was the last one. So I've learned more in the transition from having Ruby be my primary day job language to Clojure than I learned in any of those other stages. Um, it also took longer. I would, I would say, and I was thinking about whether or not my memory was clear about this, I think that that three month number is actually a reasonable approximation for all those transitions. That three months into it, I felt like, yeah, I can do stuff, you know, in this new technology. But that second in, that, that long tail of getting the alien power level is longer. Right? I, felt, I felt fairly well adapted in the other languages, you know, prior to 18 months. So. That's my own personal journey, and then a bunch of made-up lies about the community. <laughs> Let's hear from you guys. What are your questions about where the Clojure community is, where it's going, and how you might um, uh, adopt this, and how you might knock down organizational hurdles? So the question is, what is the biggest project in Clojure so far? How do you measure bigness of a project? Number of developers, value delivered, amount of time? Uh, number of developers. and. Uh system, big system? So I think that, um, to my awareness, uh, what constitutes large developer teams in the closure space these days would be you know, 10 devs. So I am not personally aware of any order of magnitude 100 devs um, closure project. In terms of the uh, size of the system, Datomic is the system with which I am most familiar. Uh, Datomic is a substantial and credible player in the database market that was written in uh, two years by a really tiny team, uh, which I think is, and there are a lot of other things out there that are you know, on a level with Datomic in terms of here's a proof of, an existence proof of things that pe uh, people are able to do. I think that, um, oh, what is, um, I'm spacing on the name of it. Storm. Well, Storm is out there, so, so Twitter Storm is out there as a big data solution in the open source space, but I was thinking more along the product startup or the, um, service startup guys, um, uh, Bradford crosses two companies. Um, so he had, he had one company, Flightcaster, which did big data analysis on airlines and was able to tell you when your flight was gonna be delayed, hopefully more accurately than the airlines could, which is he, he's sold. And then, um, what's the one he's doing now? Anybody know? I'm spacing out on the name of it. Um, that'll come to me later in the talk. And he will come to my house and beat me up when he sees this video. Uh, to my knowledge, yes, Flightcaster is, is uh, almost entirely closed. Now, to be fair, right, these, most of these systems have JavaScript on the front end. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, we're moving towards a world where people are going to build apps that are only Clojure script on the front end, and so you're going to see more and more things like that. Um, Clojure is certainly in the, in, at the phase right now where it's, it's probably a positive check mark if you want to be a ramen startup, right? If you want to go and play that, you know, funding game. Um, when you say closure, investors don't go, huh? They go, oh, you're cool. And that's good and bad, right? Because that also means that people look at it as being in an ugly place on the, on the hype cycle. Yes? So a long question, which I will resummarize uh, parts of for the film. Uh, closure and Scala are both gaining traction in the financial industry. Um, Scala is a little bit ahead to date. And um, they are starting to have some pretty substantial problems as they move from elite team down to let's make this how we work, um, how can Clojure avoid that uh, you know, when we reach that same thing? So I think that there are, I think there is a problem that Scala and Clojure have in common, which is they both are ambitious and powerful and require a skilled hand. And so to the extent that 
um, somebody comes in and tries to use either one of them as magic fairy dust sprinkled over weak developers, um, it's not going to accomplish anything. And so there's really not a good mitigation strategy for that in either case. And there, are, as with any new technology, there are going to be those kinds of uh, challenges. I think that fundamentally, um, what closure developers in the community need to do is lean into and emphasize what I consider to be its key and singular advantage, which is this emphasis on simplicity at all points. And, uh, and so, right, taking things that are, are composed together for convenience in other languages and splitting apart and delivering them a la carte. And you regularly see, you know, little micro examples of people trying to take that simplicity and mash it all back together for convenience and making a mess. So for example, on the Datomic mailing list this morning, there's a guy who said, you know, I made a database and then I queried the database and the stuff wasn't there. It's broken. And he posted his code and his code is entirely abusively sort of mutable imperative style code. It's all side effecty. It all like, you know, inside of a function creates new vars, which then other functions look at later. So when you look at it, there's just no way to see what's possibly going on. It looks like, you know, PHP translated into, into closure. And so I think helping people get get that idea. Say, look, you have the, you've got closure syntax now, but that's not enough. Right? When you have a function that makes a new database, that thing can't return nil and have magically assigned some var somewhere to point to a database. It needs to return the database. So, so simple ideas like that. And not getting distracted, in my mind, not getting distracted by things that we don't ever want to go do, like object relational mapping. Right? I'm having a perfectly happy life without objects. Thank you very much. And so uh, I think it would be a grave distraction to, to broaden and, and try to um, I mean, it's always a trade-off, right? There has to be a, a rung of the ladder that you can climb on. But the flip side is, um, if you do that by sticking the ladder back in the mud that everybody's in, your ladder is now muddy. So you've got you've to make those choices. But I think, for example, object relational mapping is one place that we should you know, you know, avoid uh, to the greatest extent possible. I would also, by the way, agree with your assessment um, that Scala is ahead in adoption. Scala is several years older than Clojure and, and should be uh, substantially ahead. But we have aspirations. Um, that uh, Scala and Clojure will both uh, carve out really tasty sized wedges of the pie over time. Right? Certainly the big pie that, that, that we're looking at is plenty big for a lot of different languages to succeed. And growing. And growing. So the question that we're actually, the, the question and then a particular anecdote that I want to focus in on. The question is, does Clojure need to penetrate the mainstream? And then the, the, the phrase, the worse is better crowd. Um, I would say that, um, let me take the worse is better on first. I think that the guy who, a lot, of the, a lot of the ideas around that meme really are about creating a false dichotomy. Right? So uh, the way to apply worse is better to what I said earlier in this talk is you can't have simple and easy at the same time. I don't buy that at all. I think you absolutely can have simple and easy at the same time, but it takes a lot of diligence and you have to be patient. And so one of the things that I constantly experience, even at relevance, is developers coming to me and trying to make something easy before they make it simple. Right? You can't go in that order because the minute you make something easy before you make it simple, um, simple is now out the window and you're never going to get it back. But that doesn't mean you can't have both. And there's certainly a lot of work to be done uh, to make the, the ecosystem easier and more approachable. That work just has to be done mindfully of the core principles. So, so part of it is counseling patience. Um, one of the things that the community struggles with is that at the core, closure moves forward uh, as quickly as core deciders can get a good understanding of the issues. And if there's not a good understanding of the issues, we don't move forward. Right? So it really requires a discipline and a patience. And I don't know the answer to that yet, so we're not going to put anything into play that we're going to then have to you know, deal with forever. Even when you try to do that, you still have that problem. Right? You always end up regretting some of the stuff you do. So the question was, Datomic, which is a commercial product, um, is there, broadly speaking, the question is, what's the ramp? What, what is there other than I have to buy in? Uh, Datomic has a free edition. Uh, the free edition is uh, capacious enough to build really substantial systems. Uh, the free edition can allow uh, two simultaneous peers. So you could build a system that had failover at the web tier, uh, talking to the database, um, all with the free edition. And, and there are definitely a ton of people using the free edition. And there are interesting products like Codec, uh, Google search C-O-D-E-Q, that, uh, that build on top of the free edition. So the question is, what's the magic fairy dust for monitoring a Clojure application? Currently, the magic fairy dust uh, in Clojure land is use the existing tools that the JVM provides. So although there is, um, 
There is a closure implement. So here's a nice example of uh, something the closure community has produced. There is a closure tool called Remon, which is designed for monitoring. But it's more of the consumer side as well as the producer side of, of, of the monitoring stuff. So there is, a, there is a closure tool out there for it. I'm not sure you know, how broad the adoption is. Uh, for Datomic, we actually started with um, AWS CloudWatch as our initial uh, monitoring approach because we were anticipating a lot of people in the cloud. But I expect we'll do other things over time. So certainly monitoring tools is an area where things could become uh, more mature. And I would put that in the same category as uh, documentation, IDE, tool support. It's all fleshing out the ecosystem around the ideas that are in play. So the question is, uh, using Clojure, how often do I have to reach into the JVM to do things? Um, some examples being uh, I.O., sockets, XML parsing, what have you. Um, so that question is actually multifaceted. Um, and it's a challenging thing. So I would, I would wrap this up under my problem of discoverability. How do I find the thing that does what I want to do? There are people out there who don't want to touch Java at all. So they want to have all closure solutions to these problems. Um, there are people out there who want to have, um, they want to match the performance of whatever the Java libraries are. So they're willing to have an all closure solution, but it has to have bad out of hell performance. I would put our work on Datomic in that second category. So um, we are happy to use Clojure to do something that gives us leverage, but, but we have to match the performance of uh, you know, whatever's out there. Um, there are some really good Java libraries that people use regularly uh, you know, from Clojure. So in um, Datomic, currently we use Netty and HornetQ, uh, for example. So it's definitely idiomatic to use those libraries when they're out there uh, and they're strong. The XML example is an interesting one because the parsing part of XML really in some sense should be fairly functional, right? It should be a function of input to output and so separated from I.O. activity to some degree. And so that's one that you might be more likely to see a relatively pure closure solution that's built on top of um, the I.O. layer coming from you know, somewhere else. So the question is, can you talk about web frameworks in Clojure and how they compete with other languages? Um, at the very bottom, the Clojure community seems to have agreed on what's called the Ring spec. So there's a library called Ring, R-I-N-G. And um, there are a lot of other libraries that all conform to that. And the Ring spec does a, lot, a really good job of treating web requests as data, where a lot of uh, other languages fail by treating web requests as specialized interfaces, which then require specialized code to manage. So a web, a web request looks like a map. Uh, session looks like a map, cookies look like a map, and so forth. So it's incredibly easy to program with. Um, uh, above that, I would say that there is a variety of choices, none of which has established dominance, and that the unnamed open source library I refu uh, referred to earlier that will be released in March uh, will allow web development. So um, it will have pluggable rendering, so you can use it for other kinds of development as well. But it will allow web development, and I hope that it will become uh, a dominant player, but that remains to be seen. So the question is, uh, there's a benefit in OO of runtime linking and polymorphism allowing you to swap implementations at runtime, and what does that feel like in Clojure? So first off, it's built, when you're running Clojure on the JVM, all the capabilities, the class loading and all that stuff that you have in Java is still available to you, and that just works. So when you're using Clojure interactively from the REPL, you can say, you know, def record, define a class, and that defines a Java class under the covers. Five lines later, you can say def record, that name again, and now you're using the new one. So there's, it's, extremely, uh, it's extremely dynamic in its use of Java's own dynamic capabilities. Um, beyond that, Clojure has polymorphism in terms of Java interfaces. It has polymorphism in terms of protocols, which are implemented with Java interfaces under the hood, but give you that separation that I talked about earlier that allow you to say interface, implementation, tying layer, which is a thing that's sadly missing uh, in places like Java. So again, you have that power, but more so. And then finally, Clojure has uh, an entirely generic multi-method system. And so uh, those of you who were at my Simulant talk earlier today, Simulant does polymorphism without ever making an object. It does polymorphism straight out of the database by looking at attributes in the database and driving polymorphically from there. So I would say that the suite of options available for polymorphism is in insanely good uh, in Clojure. And in fact, you know, um, if I appear to be taking a metaphorical dump on OO, um, that does not include polymorphism. Polymorphism is wonderful, it's a beautiful thing, and, and Clojure supports it um, fantastically. Uh, the one that you can't do from Clojure that we really strongly discourage is implementation inheritance, which everyone has started to agree is a terrible thing, right? The first round of people agreeing that it was a terrible thing was deep inheritance hierarchies are bad. 
And the second round of it, it's going to be shallow inheritance hierarchies are bad, and we just shouldn't do that. So the, there's a favoring of composition for implementation, but there's terrific support for polymorphism uh, in the language. In fact, the best of any language that I'm aware of when you combine uh, protocols and multi-methods and Java's dynamic class loading capabilities underneath. That's a really sweet spot. So, and you said you came from? Ruby O. So coming from a Ruby and OO background, you know, how to jump in. So there, um, obviously I've written a couple of books on Clojure. I think they're really nice. Um, uh, Chaz Emmerich has written a book on Clojure with O'Reilly that is, um, is very well reviewed and is an, also an introductory book. At a slightly more advanced level, um, Chowser and Fogus, these guys that only have one name, they're like Mr. T or something, um, they've written a book called The Joy of Closure. Um, I think The Joy of Closure is a terrific book. It's, it's one notch of difficulty above the others. But if you, you think of yourself as a fairly, you know, um, omni-capable Ruby programmer, you might be happy jumping straight in and seeing how much uh, trouble you can get in there. Um, and I believe that Brian Merrick has been working on um, some writing that targets OO developers specifically. Uh, his name is spelled M-A-R-I-C-K, um, but I cannot remember what the status of that is, so you might, uh, you might look at what people are doing with that. What's that? It's a Lean Pub publication, Pratik tells us. Um, so you could look at that. So the question is, is it hard selling yet another Lisp to the imperative and OO dominated world? So it's interesting. I want to tell a story about this. So you know, Relevance is about to open source an application development story for Clojure in a, in a couple of weeks. And so there's all this internal conversation about you know, the marketing of it and getting the documentation lined up and getting the contributor agreement and getting the whole process around this open source library you know, ready for people. And there's a lot of conversation that's in the terms that you just used, which is, how do I sell these ideas to somebody? And uh, one of the other guys, one of the other guys in the company uh, at one of these meetings um, made some analogy to how Ruby and Rails got started. And it got me thinking about how Ruby and Rails took off. And if you remember, and those of you who don't remember when, when David uh, Heinemeyer Hansen you know, got Ruby and Rails started, he did not have a bullet by bullet uh, set of you know, here's why this is better, here's why that is better, here's why that is better, here's why that is better. I think selling benefits, I think when, somebody, when a group of people come into a room, as they have now, specifically, presumably, with the stated purpose of hearing about benefits, then I think it's time to enumerate the benefits, but not in a particularly salesman-y mode. But I think that, that far more important is to do good things with it, right? And I think that that's a great lesson that could be taken from Ruby and Rails. The reason that the Ruby and Rails took off was not that he had a nice academic proof that all this stuff was a good idea. The reason was he conveyed excitement for doing stuff, and the real reason was developers who had taken six months to do something went home with Ruby and Rails over a weekend and came back with something better than they had built in those six months. And so I think it's finding those areas of categoric, categoric advantage and shipping awesome stuff is vastly more useful than persuading. I'm not in the persuading business anymore. It's just, it's just too time-consuming and sad and tiresome to say, I think X, Y, Z, and you think A, B, C, and let's have a discussion about it. Here's X, Y, Z, I think they're cool, and I'm gonna go build something awesome with them. And if other people build awesome stuff with it too, then you know, other people will come. So, my name is Stuart Halloway. You can get information about my presentations from that GitHub wiki. If you'd like to have me speak at your organization, my contact information is there as well. If you can't remember that, you can just shout at Stuart Halloway on Twitter and find me that way. I very much enjoy the opportunity to speaking to the DevNexus crowd. This is my first time here, and I hope I'll be back. Thank you very much.